Good evening. It's a great pleasure to speak with you again. I'm going to speak on the topic of arthritis of the hip and knee. And the title of my presentation is Don't Let Arthritis Keep You Down, A Hiker's Guide to Hip and Knee Arthritis. So my name is Brian Devitt. So I'm going to start with a picture of a patient of mine. Uh, this is a lady I did a knee replacement on, and we're hiking here in Vietnam. So it's a couple of features. First of all, she's smiling, so she's pretty happy. She's also using a walking pole. And she's got the appropriate walking equipment, including walking boots and her backpack. And she's willing to take the assistance of our guide, which is walking up quite a steep terrain. So we see a lot of patients of ours who are interested in hill walking and hiking. And it's a fantastic pursuit. It's one I enjoy myself also. But unfortunately, they are afflicted by arthritis, which affects the knee and also the hip. And our uh, goal is to get them back on the mountain and allow them to continue their pursuits hopefully without surgery, but occasionally we need to intervene. So while we were in Vietnam, we learned about Confucius, and he's a fantastic quote, which I think really uh, sums up this, this talk and the treatment of arthritis in general. It doesn't matter how slow you go as long as you do not stop. So that's the key factor to keep our joints moving. So we all come in different shapes and sizes. Some of us have straight legs, some of us have bow legs, and some of us have valgus or, or knock knees. And it also is the same with the hips in terms of the shape of our hip joints. And those, some of those people are more predisposed to getting arthritis, particularly people with knock knees tend to get more arthritis in the front of the knee, and they can particularly have issues walking down hills. But long before we uh, go into the surgical field, we speak to patients, patients in our clinic and we find out what exactly is their issue. Our main uh, goal with any type of arthritis is to try to keep people going as long as they can. But when people start getting a lot of pain within their knees, particularly affecting them at night and affecting their sleep, that really has an impact on their quality of life. So therefore, those type of patients are more likely to present for surgical opinion um, if they've exhausted all non-operative measures. For the most part, um, GPs and physiotherapists are well able to manage mild arthritis issue symptoms. And uh, I'll talk to you about the effective treatment uh, in due course. But I wanted to start with just a few x-ray examples of those type of patients we see. So this is an x-ray of someone with bow knees, bow legs, and severe arthritis of the inside part of the knee. You'll see this on both sides. So just keep it, remember this, this x-ray, I'll show you a bit later how we manage this case. We also get other patients who have um, maybe knock knees. Um, but if you look at the joint space here on the outside between the femur and the tibia, there's plenty of space on the outside of the joint and also plenty of space on the inside. And this is symmetrical. So this person doesn't have a problem with the uh, inside or outside of the knee. But if you look at the knee from the side, you see that they have lots of problems in the front of the knee where the space between the kneecap and the front of the knee is quite um, diminished. So that's, this person has pain on the front of the knee or anterior knee pain, as we call it. And we do this other view where you see quite clearly that there is very little space between the kneecap and the front of the femur. So this, problem, this person has awful issues going down hills or going down stairs. We then look at um, some people and they, they have asymmetrical arthritis. So in this individual, he has a loss of joint space on the inside of his, his left knee, but his right knee is fine and the outside of the left knee is also fine. So how do you manage these cases? And we'll see an example later on. And we look at the front of his knee and there's plenty of space between the kneecap and the femur. We also look at people with hip arthritis and I deal with, with many of these patients and we see quite clearly on the right hip that the hip is superiorly migrated. So it's moved up compared to the left hip, which is a ball and socket joint. But you see the ball here is, has lost its position and you see the, there's lots of little cysts, these gray areas within, this, within the femoral head, which is as a result of severe arthritis. So this individual is a keen a mountain walker, but couldn't walk because his, he had a mark, marked limp on the right side, and you can see why. And then we have individuals who have um, arthritis of both hips, and they really notice that their stiffness is a big issue. So really struggling to put his walking boots on or struggling to really just get up a hill because he can't lift his or flex his knee because his hip is so stiff to get up those steep inclines. So I'm going to go back to, to school now for a bit of physics, and you'll see why um, Isaac Newton was so right, and he wasn't an orthopedic surgeon, but he, he knew a lot about gravity and the effect of gravity. And we also know that when people have a lot of weight on or are hiking, that the, the, the load going through their knees, particularly going downhill, tends to be a lot more. So if we talk about the weight that goes 
through our knees or hips when we walk. So we're just walking twice body weight goes to our knees on average. When we're walking downhill, that increases to four times. So we often feel a little bit exhausted going uphill because of the, um, uh, the physical demands, but going downhill is what really hurts our knees. Um, but if you're running downhill or running on any surface, it's eight times your body weight. So one of the first treatments of arthritis in individuals is to reduce your body weight. Um, and that reduces the, the uh, load going through the knees and the hips. So it's a key factor to, to remember. But let's just take a calculation uh, of an example. So 100 kilogram male, so you imagine a little bit overweight, it's 400 kilograms walking downhill that individual is putting through each knee. When we talk about a 10 kilogram weight loss, so it's 10% body weight, that's 40 kilograms less per knee per step going downhill. So it's significant the impact that this has on, on the treatment of people with, with arthritis. Well, let's talk about specifically how do we avoid injuries while hiking? Well, I think the key factor is knowing your limits. So we're not going to start off climbing Everest in terms of our pursuit. Uh, we're going to do probably a more of a, a, a flat walk to initially and then increasing to an incline. We also recognize we need to improve um, strength around the ankle and, and our general core and um, st um, strength and our stability within our abdominal muscles. So I often recommend Pilates as a fantastic exercise, particularly reformer Pilates for a holistic um, body approach and um, to maintaining strength. One of the simple factors is using walking poles. So we're able to dissipate the load going through our knees by helping our knees out with our arms. And it adds to, to good balance. So walking poles are a fantastic addition when we, when we hike uh, to help our knees out. So it's important to wear the appropriate footwear. So we're not going to go walking with, with um, these type of sandals as you'll slip or something for with a bit of ankle support is appropriate. And it's also appropriate to have the, the rest of your clothing uh, correct that if you're if you're walking on icy um, uh, environments, you need to have some type of crampon or something on the, your feet so you can actually uh, get some grip and just be cautious going out if it's very slippy because you will injure yourself and uh, sustain a fracture and, and protect and also exacerbate arthritis on occasion. It's also really important to uh, hydrate adequately because then you have better um, physical uh, function. You'll be better, more equipped for the uh, pursuits that you're going to um, uh, engage in. So let's just look at the treatment that works with arthritis. There's a variety of treatments which people um, um, have been um, promoting over the years. And this is a, a very famous quote from Macbeth. I have newt, toe, frog, wool of bat, tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm, sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing, or a charm of powerful trouble like a hell broth boil and bubble. And I bring this up because it's amazing how many people come up to me and have all these outlandish types of treatments. And none of these work for arthritis, by the way, but it's important just to stick to the tried and trusted in, in my mind. If we look at um, just a Google search of arthritis, uh, you'll find a whole array of different treatments. And oftentimes it's the sponsored ones or the, the more wacky ones with laser therapy, people suggesting stem cells with no backup in terms of evidence. So I really think it's important that we stick to the tried and trusted. So let's look at the non-operative approach or conservative management, as some people call it. So keeping up your activity is really important. So by staying still, as Confucius told us, you're, you're really going to struggle. So you don't want to stop. Keep active. We want to do exercise that is not going to affect you or going to you know, give you those sleepless nights because of pain. As I mentioned, and I showed you the equations, that weight loss is really important. Probably one of the best methods of reducing the pain with arthritis. Acupuncture, you know, hasn't been found to be uh, hugely effective, but, you know, it doesn't do any major harm. But I wouldn't spend a lot of money on it if it's not going to do, do good. Massage can help out. But sometimes if your muscles are very crampy, particularly around an arthritic knee, that can be helpful. Using braces provides a little bit of support, but hasn't been shown to reduce the progression of arthritis. Insoles, likewise, they make you kind of feel that you're a little more secure in your footwear, but haven't been found to reduce arthritis. Glucosamine has not been found to be effective, but it's a cheap, easy medication to take. And in my mind, if people want to take it, I don't discourage them. If they have the placebo effect, at least that's good enough for me. We look at the pharmacological treatment and we see anti-inflammatories and they're very effective because anti-inflammatories reduce the fluid within the knee. When you have fluid within your knee, you're more likely to have inhibition of the muscles, particularly the quadriceps, the muscles at the front of the knee. And they're very active when we're walking downhill. So if you can activate those muscles because 
when you're fluid, they don't activate. If you get rid of the fluid and can activate those muscles, you tend to be much less symptomatic. Steroid injections can occasionally be helpful, but they don't, they don't alter the natural history of the condition. They just give you a bit of pain relief. And similarly with hyaluronic acid, which is a chondroprotective jelly, that can be helpful, but only really in the early stages of arthritis. And it's typically to give you enough pain relief that you can get on with your strengthening exercises. Platelet-rich plasma, once again, is it, the, the jury's out in terms of its effectiveness, but it has been shown to be effective in certain studies. In terms of surgical treatment, in the past, you, people used to get an arthroscopic washout when they had arthritis, and we no longer do that because it, it hasn't been found to be effective. Occasionally, if there's a displaced meniscal tear with good joint space, um, we can do an arthroscopy to remove a displaced tear, but it tends to be not the gold standard treatment nowadays. We can change the shape of the leg if there's too much load going through one side of the joint. And this is typically uh, reserved for younger patients. And this is a salvage procedure to offset and or postpone uh, a joint replacement later on, but it can be very successful in certain cases. And joint replacement therapy is extremely successful when needed. And we try to try to push this down the road as long as we can. But when we do it, patients tend to do very well following joint replacement. So let's just revise or go back to some of the images we saw. So this is the first case of bilateral, so both knees affected with arthritis. So in this individual, they have arthritis, particularly of the inside, but also severe arthritis at the front of the knee and uh, also arthritis towards the outside of the knee. So in this case, this individual got uh, bilateral knee replacement. So we actually did them at, on the bo at both at the same time because she had um, severe arthritis, which affected both legs. So nowadays, we're more likely to do both sides if both sides are affected. Obviously, if only one side is affected, we just do that side. But it really, it, it stands to reason if you get reduce your rehabilitation, the risks aren't significantly increased by doing both at the same time. But if one leg can't achieve full extension or full straightening um, and you're doing a joint replacement on, on the other leg, it really is hard to rehabilitate. So that's why we do both together. If they're both affected, we tend to treat both at the same time. So this is um, uh, the example of the lady of the patient who had the valgus knee with the arthritis under the kneecap. So in this case, um, as we saw previously, the joint space on the inside and outside of the knee was well preserved. So we just did an isolated joint replacement of the kneecap joint. And this was very effective for her. Her issue was walking downstairs and walking downhill. And because she'd really no arthritis on the other side of the joint, we did an isolated patellofemoral joint resurfacing. So this is a very effective treatment for her um, and she did very well and got back on the hills. This is the other example of the isolated um, unicompartmental knee arthritis. So just the one side of the knee here on the uh, left side, the inside of the left knee. And this gentleman, we did a partial knee replacement of just the inside of the knee. And once again, he got back to it was all his pursuits um, without any major issue. And in this case, his knee felt really just back to normal because we hadn't taken away any of the ligaments and we just resurfaced the side of the joint. So you see it quite clearly here. And we're just resurfacing that side of the joint and pulling a metal resurfacing and then a plastic in between the two sides of the joint. So one of the tibia with a tray and plastic, which you can't see in the x-ray, lies in between the two joints. So in terms of your knee replacement, what I always say is for knees in particular, earn your knee replacement. The key factors are weight loss, modify your activity if possible, if you need to use walking aids, really effective, maintain your strength and physical activity and use anti-inflammatory medication. From my perspective, there's a limited role for arthroscopy and only seek to have a knee replacement when you're ready. And your surgeon will speak to you about this and try to exhaust all non-operative measures before you go down the route of surgery. And these are typically the indications are night pain and significant quality of life issues. It's really affecting your ability to do things you want to do. It's key and really important. The next question I ask is how active can I be with a knee replacement? And nowadays um, we let people do whatever they want to do really in terms of getting back to their, their own activity. You, you, you recognize that people are probably going to run a marathon at that point. When they get arthritis, they tend to be slightly on in years, so it's not in their interest or their, their, their to run marathons. But a lot of people can back on the mountain, hiking, skiing, and really do whatever you want to do. And um, we're very, we're not very particular in terms of limiting you, but most people will be so certainly limiting their own uh, exercise tolerance. But we definitely encourage to get back to most activities. I want to share with you a quote I got from a, a patient of mine who's a farmer and. 
he misread the post-operative reviews. Instead of coming back at six weeks, he came back at six months. And I asked him, did he have any pain? And he said, occasionally I get pain. I said, when do you get pain? And he said, when, after shearing 50 sheep. So he was a very active man with his knee replacement. But he told me something very insightful and I share with a lot of my patients. He said, I quickly realized that it was a case of me getting uh, used to my knee. Um, or sorry, it was a case of my knee getting used to me and not me getting used to my knee. And it was really interesting just to turn it that he, he wanted to get on with his pursuits and his knee just had to come along with him. He wasn't going to sit down and molly cuddle his knee. So it's a very nice quote. I think from his perspective, and I think it sums up what we expect for patients after knee replacement. So finally, I just want to show you the, the other um, examples we started at, at the beginning of the, the talk. And this is the example of, of severe hip arthritis. And I do the hip through what we call an anterior approach. So we divide between the muscles at the front of the hip. And this allows people to get back to their activities very quickly. And this is an example of how we template the hip. So we, we use the x-rays and we, we measure the appropriate size. And the advantage of doing it, this approach is I can x-ray during the surgery so I can try to mimic what I've templated and also ensure that we get the prosthesis in a good position. And this is the final product. So this is a nice hip replacement. So you see the hip is nicely balanced now. And this individual is back to all his normal activities within three months of surgery. The advantage from my perspective with the anterior approach is that we don't have as many precautions. So um, some people that you know, restrict them how they lie in bed, we're happy for people to get up and walk the same day of surgery and get back to their normal activities as quickly as they can. And finally, the other example of an individual uh, who has arthritis, particularly affecting the right hip, but also arthritis of the left hip where there's extra bone forming here. So this is the man who really struggled to walk up hills because his hips were so stiff and couldn't put on his walking boots. Well, just like in the when you've arthritis of both knees, we did a bilateral hip replacement in this individual. So the both combined procedures take less than two hours, and he was up and walking the same day of surgery. So he was back to all his normal activities as well. So there are, we can certainly nowadays can manage most arthritic problems with ease, um, and, but it's the key factor is when we ch choose surgery, and the key decision maker in that is the patient. So my objective is to get you back on the hills, get you enjoying the outdoors for as long as possible. Um, and uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Grant, thanks for a really interesting talk. There are a few questions coming in already there. Um, we'll start with uh, Paddy Callahan. Um, RE cartilage and knee joints. Do most people have an infinite amount of steps or mileage possible without needing knee or hip surgery? Or should very fit and active people in their 70s be reducing their amount of physical exercise do, do they need to minimize the risk of needing surgery? Uh, hi, Fiona. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think in many respects, people, there's a genetic predisposition to developing arthritis. So we can't really fight genetics, but we can fight our, our environment and, and what we put into our bodies. And I think, you know, really keeping fit as we age is so important. It's important yeah. for our physical well-being, but also our mental well-being. And I think moving uh, as much as we can um, within reason, I think, is, is really important as we age. But keeping your body weight down is, is, is it puts less load through your joints. So definitely keeping a really physical um, and active um, like um, activity level is, is hugely important. Good. Thank you. Um, Fiona, is there anything you can do to prevent further deterioration um, of knees that is non-invasive? Do supplements help? Any exercises can help strengthen the knee, prevent pain. Going downhill is very painful. Um, I'm now 60 and really want to remain fit and active. What should I do? Yeah, so um, a lot of the stuff which I, I kind of mentioned in my talk kind of um, uh, recovers this point. And really, we, we want to look at the tried and trusted uh, methods. And one of the things that we're very big on in uh, UKMC SSC is using evidence-based practice. So, you know, supplements um, have not been shown to really reduce the the rates of arthritis, but they don't do any major harm. So if you feel it gets some, some effect and individuals can benefit um, differently, uh, I would have no problem recommending them. The key factors is keeping the muscles strong around around the body, um, and you know doing exercises to strengthen the quadriceps is particularly good for going downstairs. Um, you can have minimally invasive procedures like injections can be helpful uh, in the short term. But as I mentioned, once the pain gets so severe that it affects your quality of life and particularly your sleep, you're looking at um, you know more invasive methods like joint replacements, which are very very successful. 
Thank you. Um, after joint replacement, are there restrictions one should observe when hiking or hill walking? Well, I think you just need to be sensible regarding um, what to do afterwards. And we, we, we recommend in the early phase that really the key focus is regaining range of motion and normalizing one's gait. I think that's really important. So we walk before we run. And I think, you know, doing the likes of hiking is a little bit more robust and it, it, it re requires more um energy and it puts the knee through a greater degree of load so we have to be prepared for that i think building up the strength in our lower legs is really important before we embark on a hike and i think then it's also just listening to your body i think in the early post-operative period there's still a lot of swelling and uh, i have a little phrase that um with, with respect to the wound that once the wound goes white there's no pain at night that once you see your wound whitening you mean the inflammation has has gone and you stop having discomfort in the evenings and that's really a good phase where you get back into the more rigorous activities like hiking okay thank you what's the life expectancy of a hip replacement joint um, it's hard to say. I think the, the modern hip replacements really are, are fantastically manufactured and, and and they can last for a really long time. I was at a conference recently and one of the presenters was asked that same question and they, they had a good answer, which says that there's a failure rate of 1% per year that the, the hip replacement is in. So if you think about 20 years, you have a hip replacement, there's an 80% chance that that hip is going to be functioning very well. And that's failure for all causes. Um, so I think that kind of rule of thumb probably applies. Okay, thank you. Uh, lady, I, she's nine weeks post knee replacement, still has pain at night, but, but it's early there. She's good movement, physio's happy with her. How soon would you recommend hill walking? Um, she's doing a lot of strengthening exercises in the gym. She's only nine yeah. months still. Yeah. So as I said, that kind of fits into my my phrase: uh, yeah. no pain at night yeah. if the wound. Yeah. yeah. So I think that um, she, you'd expect the pain to dissipate by probably uh, twelve weeks, so three months post operatively the pain. So it have a little bit of discomfort is no harm, and I probably emphasise that she's she's doing some good work as it sounds from from her range of motion. So really, you, she can start integrating maybe some gentle inclines in her walks um, and definitely take some walking poles and really start getting back into it. But start with small little little um, you know hikes, not too long. Don't get stranded up a mountain and in pain. And if there is a little bit of discomfort after a hike, there's no harm at that stage taking some uh, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories if it is a little bit painful. But we, we're, we're very much of the opinion you need to use your knee. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, that quote, um, don't let your knee define your life. You just go on with your life and your knee will yeah. follow. Yes, thanks. Uh, someone here, they have a lateral tear in the left hip, um, very active in various sports, including hiking. But what can they do to prevent it returning regularly? Yeah, so I think um, it's kind of labral tears in, in the hip are, are kind of a, an awful lot of times are precursor to developing arthritis. I think, you know, if they're very painful and, um, you know, there's a lot of swelling in the hip, they're taking anti-inflammatories is very important. Um, an injection can be helpful if there's fluid in the hip. And a lot of these labral tears will settle down with time. So it's kind of avoiding any kind of deep flexion can be an issue. So if the individual is hiking in very yeah. steep inclines, that might exa exacerbate the pain. So building up the strengths and just treating the inflammation is the key factor in, er in managing uh, labral tears. Okay. Um, so I'm just asking about, do knee issues interfere with the lower back? Uh, they can. And um, it, it relates to the posture and uh, one um, has when they walk. I think it's really important if you can't extend your knees, uh, you, you tend to walk with the more flex posture of your knees. And if you try to walk with your knees flex, you'll find your hips flex over and then it puts a bit more strain to your lower back. So we often find people, particularly with hips, actually less so with knees, but do present with lower back pain. And oftentimes when you resolve the contracture or, or stiffness within the hip by a hip replacement, the lower back improves. It doesn't completely settle in all cases because you can have arthritis there too, but it typically improves. And likewise with the knees, if you get the knees straight. Yeah, thank you. Um, as I'm saying, um, some doctors don't recommend dicine or anti-inflammatory medicine. Medicine. Do you have any views on this? And um, how regularly should they take analgesia if they're hiking? Yeah, well, I, I have no problem um, with people taking diaphene, provided there's no contraindications um, in terms of other medications they're taking. But, you know, occasional diaphene is, is not that harmful. And if it's taken by, as per the recommended 
um, methods after food. And if there's any gastritis, you can take some proton pump inhibitors to help the stomach. But really, occasional diethine is, is, is helpful if you have inflammation. And in fact, it's very useful to reduce the, the inflammation in a joint and allow the muscles to work. So I'd say it can really treat a lot of problems very nicely. If you're taking it on a daily basis, that's something that you need to look at um, and and discuss that with your GP because it probably heralds that your joint is worse than you you maybe think it is. Fine. Thanks very much for joining us tonight.